Well, we just, uh, we just prayed that God will uh, illuminate us uh, and illuminate our understanding of his word. And that's a good prayer to pray when we come to hear the message for today. Uh, we're going to turn to Psalm number 71. Psalm number 71. And uh, the theme, if you like, the idea of this message and um, hopefully several others perhaps along this line. We'll see how we go. Uh, the theme is growing old in the grace of God. Okay, growing old in the grace of God. You may not be there yet, but you will be one day. Uh, we trust and pray. So that's the idea. Turning to Psalm 71, and uh, I'm going to be referring to the whole of the psalm uh, over the next few couple of messages at least anyway, but there's Psalm 71. Now, what is it? Well, it's, it's a psalm written by David, and most of the commentators are agreed that this must be David writing in his old age. Uh, and they, they base that uh, understanding or interpretation of it on the content of the psalm, on the things that he says in the psalm and the references he makes. Uh, so we're going to follow that line of thinking. So this is David. Remember, now just remember what you know about David, King David, the David who slew Goliath and became the king, the one in the line of the Messiah who was ultimately the son of David. See? So keep that in mind and uh, think of him in his old age because he says things uh, along those lines. For example, in verse 6, let me just point out a few things that he says to you. In verse 6 he says, I have been upheld from birth. I have been upheld from birth. You are he who took me out of my mother's womb. My praise shall be continually of you. So, uh, verse 9. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Do not forsake me when my strength fails. Or what about verses 17 to 18? O oh God, you have taught me from my youth, and to this day I declare your wondrous works. Now also, when I am old and grey-headed, O oh God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who is to come. And then verse 20. Um, here's uh, really the story of his life, at least the last, last half of his life, I would think. Listen to what he says. You have shown me, God, you have shown me great and severe troubles. You shall revive me again and bring me up again from the depths of the earth. So David in his old age. So what actually is involved in growing old in the grace of God? What is involved in growing old and being old as a Christian believer? What can we learn from David? What can we observe here and what lessons? Well, I've got five general observations. Don't panic. I've got five general observations and I've got five, uh, five points, if you want to call them that. Um, and we're not going to get through all these today, but don't worry about that, but we'll just see how we go. But first of all, some general observations from the Bible about being old, about old age. And these are general things that the Bible says. You could probably add to the list, but the Bible at least makes these points. For example, the Bible says time and again that age matters. Now, I know that's against the grain of the culture we're in at the moment, but we're interested in what the Bible says, and the Bible's perspective is that age matters, that age is significant, that age deserves to be respected. And time and again, that point is made in one way or another in the Bible. For example, 
when the Bible talks, particularly uh, in the Old Testament, and it talks about elders, it's not just talking about uh, some office bearer, it's talking about someone who is old, someone who is experienced, someone who has been walking with the Lord a long time. Elders were literally elders. They were elders in in sense of their, their spiritual influence in the life of churches, but they were also comparatively uh, experienced and elder. So it's age matters. The second observation from the Bible. Aged people matter. So old people matter. Aged people matter in the Bible. This is really important because we remember last week that pamphlet that someone uh, distributed and we drew attention to where now progressively different states are talking about uh, you know, bringing in bills with regard to the right to terminate life. And terminate life when the person themselves thinks that it should be terminated or perhaps when someone else thinks it should be terminated. Now, the Bible, as far as the Bible is concerned, aged people matter. In fact, they're very, very, very significant. There are some extremely old people in the Bible. I mean, ridiculously old. We, we, we can't get our mind around how old they are. And these people are very, very significant people. And often they're not significant until they are old. And, they're not, and they don't enter into what the Lord really has for them to do until they are old. And that's when they prove to be most valuable, most useful, and most important uh, in their influence on other people, other believers as well. So this is a very important perspective. The Bible, thirdly, the Bible says that age is a blessing from God. Age is a blessing from God. If you are able to live to a, a reasonable age, you need to give the credit to God. You need not to become proud about that, think that it's something you've done. Uh, it's a blessing from God. This is how the Bible represents it. And you've got things like, I just uh, thought of Proverbs uh, 16 and verse 31. Um, the silver-haired head is a crown of glory if it is found or when it is found in the way of righteousness. The silver-haired head or the hoary head, H-O-A-R, the hoary head is a crown of righteousness. Have you been, uh, have you been in the northern hemisphere in winter and woken up and gone out and seen a real frost? A real frost where everything is grey and silver a hoar frost they call it and Proverbs says a hoary head, a grey head is a crown of righteousness uh, a blessing from God and a crown of righteousness when it is found in that way of righteousness the fourth general observation age is crucial to the functional fellowship of a local church or a gathering of God's people. To have represented in a, in a, in a local fellowship, in a local church, aged people is extremely important. In fact, it, I would almost say, if you don't have it, it's going to be difficult to be functional in a biblical sense. Because there's a sense in which if you understand how God gathers people together in churches, he does it deliberately and it should be multi-racial, it should be multinational, and it should represent all age groups and particularly valuable are people who have been on the road as Christians a long time. Absolutely crucial to adding a dimension to a fellowship which, is, which can be missing. Now I know again common today to have sort of monocultural churches they might have a Korean church or a university church or a Chinese church but that isn't how the Bible sees the model of a church at all it's meant to be 
multicultural, multinational, and especially across the spectrums of the ages. And it's not really a good idea to start dividing your church up too markedly according to ages. It's a much better policy and practice as a church to think you're going to include everybody. So everybody will be involved in something. So I think back to the uh, different churches I've been in, you have a Sunday school picnic. You don't only invite the Sunday school children and the Sunday school teachers, you invite the whole church. So you encourage the, 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 the understanding and the mindset that we are God's people together and we can all bring something to uh, each other. So crucial to the functional fellowship of God's people. Uh, we do well to listen and look and learn from each other, which is what we do. And uh, fifthly then, um, service and witness never stop. That's an observation from the Bible. Service and witness never stop. Now, I'm not saying, you know, sort of organised official service as, a, as, as you might say someone holds a particular position and uh, of course that stops, that should stop and people have got to know when to stop and that's a problem when people don't know when to stop but people have got to know when to stop but in terms of the informal function of being a Christian at the heart of that is your service for Christ and your witness for Christ and that never ends. You don't retire from that. So you never retire from serving Christ in, in some form or other, in whatever form that is. And you don't retire from being a witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. So, that's the background. That's just five sort of general observations um, about age. Now, let me come to the things out of Psalm 71. I suppose this is a bit cheesy, but I've, I've called this Golden Principles for the Golden Years. It is cheesy, yeah. <laughs> and they're not particularly golden, are they? <coughs> really. But anyway, the point is, what can we learn from David in Psalm 71? So these are five things. Right? I'm only going to deal with the first one today, but I'll give you the five, uh, the, five, the five lessons that I think David teaches us in Psalm 71 from the perspective of being an aged Christian in the grace of God. Number one, he has a keen sense of his own condition. That comes through time and again in the psalm. In the psalm you read, you can almost hear sometimes, the anxiety, the weakness, the need, the fear. It's all there. Why is it there? It's there because he has a keen sense of his own condition. And that's very, very helpful and important. That's number one. The second, uh, the second, thing, the second lesson is this. We, he, and we will face unrelenting opposition. Unrelenting opposition. In other words, the warfare never lets up. Never lets up. The warfare doesn't let up when you let up. I think that's a very important point that he makes, as we shall see. He says... You grow, you may grow weary and tired and weak. Trust to the fact that the enemy does not do that. He does not do that. So, opposition, you, he faces unrelenting opposition, even as an old man, and so will you, and so will I. Very important to remember that. The third thing, the third lesson is that when it all came down to it in his, in his old age he alludes to this he retired and resorted to prayer and worship let me say that again 
because you get, you'll get to a point and you might have seen this and experienced it with others you will get to a point where there is nothing left but prayer you, you will get to a point where perhaps you won't be able to worship you won't be able to go to worship I've, I've met many Christians and, and ministered to many Christians and really the bottom line is and they tell you this themselves they've been very active very committed very, very involved but now they've reached a point what can I do? I can't do anything all I can do is pray and you say, don't say, don't say that. Prayer is everything. Don't say, all I can do is pray. That's a marvellous thing. That's the most important thing. Where would we be without the prayers of the uh, aged saints among God's people in churches? Where would we be? Eh? So, he got this. He's got it in his mind. He understands it. Retiring and resorting to prayer and worship the third thing is uh, sorry the fourth thing is and this comes through also I'll draw your attention to the verses as we go through this little series but the fourth thing is he's got an eye and a word for the next generation that's a very good thing he's got an eye and a word for the next generation Look at verse 16 I will make mention of your righteousness or verse uh, 18 don't forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation See? wonderful isn't it wonderful to love young people love them love children love the young people in your church Love the children, love the grandchildren. This is so important, so wonderful. Have an opportunity to have some input into their lives from the perspective of you having been a Christian for a long time and here you are wanting them to become a Christian, wanting to encourage them in their Christian faith and seize the opportunity to do that. And uh, fifthly and finally, David knew how to fall back on good theology he knew what good theology was and he had some good theology and he knew and you and I I hope need to learn this lesson if we haven't learned it yet he knew that in the end the only thing that will uphold him is good theology good sound theology and that's, we'll get to that eventually. But first of all, um, in the few minutes we have today, we're going to think about number one. He had a keen sense of his own condition. And what I mean by that was, when he thought about himself and assessed himself, he was accurate. He was honest. He was informed. He was informed about himself. He allowed scripture and experience to inform him about himself. He learned from it. He learned and he knew the value of applying things to himself. And we all know, we all know the value of applying things to other people. We do it almost instinctively. The trouble is we apply things to other people and don't apply them to ourselves. Or we apply things to other people before we apply it to ourselves. Well, he's very, he's very clear about this in terms of his own condition and understanding it. Well, what was it? What is that condition that he communicates to us through this psalm and in other places? What does he, what does he reveal about himself? Well, you can pick it up. Like I said already, you can pick it up easily. You know, he's, he's, growing, he's growing weaker. Uh, he's calling out to the Lord for strength, for protection, uh, and, and for, that, uh, for that nearness of God. Don't be far from me, oh my God. 
He senses that he's more vulnerable, that he's weaker, that he's he's a, he's a shadow. In one way, he's a shadow of the person that stood in front of Goliath. Now, spiritually, he's not, not at all. But physically, physically, emotionally, mentally, he is. These things throughout his life have taken their toll. He's weary. He's growing weary. Now, why is it like this? Well, why it's like this for David, you have to remember David's history. And the key verse, I'm going to read you a key passage, because this, this little passage will explain to you a lot about David and the second half of his life and leading up to his old age. In 2 Samuel and chapter 12, from verse 8 to 15. Now let me read you this. Now remember about David. David's a man after God's own heart, anointed to be the king of Israel. He's in the line of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's an exceptional an outstanding trophy of God's grace. But nonetheless, he's a sinner. And he sinned greatly. And, and listen to this, and then you'll start to get the perspective. Um, I'm picking it up in 2 Samuel 12, at verse 8, and I'll read it to you. Um, Nathan, comes to, Nathan the prophet comes to David. Uh, and this is with regard to David's sin of adultery with Bathsheba. And he says to him, uh, I gave you your master's house. This is Nathan saying, this is what God is saying to you, David. Uh, I gave you your master's house, your master's wives, into your keeping. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah, and if that had been too little, I would have given you very much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You've killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You've taken his, his wife to be your wife. You've killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Wicked, evil, idolatrous people. Now David, hear this. Therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house. I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly. But I will do this thing before all Israel, before the son. And so David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child who is born to you shall surely die. And then Nathan departed to his house. So the rest of his life now from the moment of that until the time when he dies, if you know the story of David, is going to be marked with one trial, one problem, one difficulty, one adversary after another. Is he a believer? Yes, of course he's a believer. Will he be in heaven? Yes, of course he'll be in heaven. What does this say then? What's, what's this about? Well, this is about it's about good theology, really. You see, part of what it means to be a Christian and to be human is that the effects now don't misunderstand what I'm about to say the effects and the consequences of sin are not all dealt with in this life. I say that again. The effects and the consequences of my sin 
and your sin perhaps are not all going to be dealt with in this life now before you think that's heresy let me try and explain what I mean there is absolutely no shadow of a doubt at all that the guilt the penalty and the power of sin have all been wonderfully dealt with in the death of Christ as have the consequences of sin really the guilt the penalty and the power of sin have been broken in your life they've been disarmed they've been defeated you're encouraged to take up a part in their ongoing defeat mortify the deeds of the old life put to death the deeds of the body turn away from them but you're still going to physically die that's an effect of sin and you will continue on in your Christian life marked by some of the effects and scars of sinful actions, choices that you took even when you were a Christian and those things will stay on your psyche and on your record of your record perhaps not on God's and they will have an effect on you but don't worry because all will be well in the end because the atonement that Christ has made is for body and soul so all of this is righted completely and wonderfully and absolutely redemption is total the price has been paid the price has been paid for you to have a, a resurrection body like the Lord Jesus Christ absolutely perfect but the realisation of that will not happen until you step into heaven so you will carry with you and David will carry with him as he does the consequences the effects they're not God doesn't just step in all the time and remove all the consequences of the bad choices you made since you became a Christian and some of them are big things and some of them you just have to live with them oh, he's forgiven them even as Nathan said to David the Lord has put away your sin well hang on doesn't that contradict what you just said about the sword never departing from my house and now you say the Lord has put away my sin don't those two things contradict each other no they do not the Lord has put away my sin but there is such a thing as sanctification there is such a thing as chastening the fatherhood of God etc etc so this is David's this is David's history so that text about the sword never departing that came true in his experience read the story Absalom Amnon Adonijah on it goes he himself numbering numbering the, 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 the troops uh, and so on this is, you, you need to read the story of David in First and Second Samuel ok now against that background here in Psalm 71 with this keen sense he's got now imagine that, that would never have left him that declaration by Nathan about the sword never leaving his house that would never have left David's memory everything would have been seen through that grid from then on that happened to him he would have thought back no doubt at all to that well here he is and look at what he prays you see his first prayer request and this is a prayer request that never never goes out of fashion in the Bible I wonder if you've ever prayed it Psalm 71 verse 1 in you O Lord I put my trust ne let me never be ashamed let me never be put to shame let me never be put to shame again you could add because he has been put to shame let me never be put to shame 
Now what is shame? Shame. The Oxford Dictionary defines shame like this. It's a painful feeling of humiliation caused by the consciousness of wrong behaviour. Well, good on the Oxford Dictionary for saying there is such a thing as wrong behaviour. A painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by the consciousness of wrong behaviour. Where does it come from? Where did it come from? Shame. Where did it come from? Think back to Genesis. Think back to the garden. Think back to Adam and Eve. They were both naked and they were not ashamed. And then they sinned. And then what happened? They were ashamed. They sewed fig leaves together. They hid when God came walking in the cool of the day in the garden. And he called out for them, Where are you? Where are you? We were afraid. We were afraid. Who told you? They were ashamed. Shame. It's a consequence of creation. By that I mean it's a consequence of being made in the image of God and being given a conscience. God's given people a conscience. It's part of being made in the image of God. Now that conscience might be marred, it might be seared, it might be almost obliterated in some people's case. But conscience. Every human being is stamped with it, you see. So this is where shame comes. But this is a great prayer request. And it opens the psalm and it's repeated many times in scripture. In you, O Lord, I put my trust, he says, let me never be put to shame. Now why would you pray like that to God? What does that mean when you say it to God? Let me never be put to shame. Well, there are two perspectives on this prayer request. One's Godward and one's manward. So, if it's Godward, then it could be, don't let me down, God. Let me never be put to shame. Don't let me down, God. From a manward perspective, it would be, don't let me let you down, God. Let me never be ashamed. Well, what does he mean when he says it? What does he mean? Well, perhaps he's thinking, what happens if God appears to desert me? After all, after me saying, I trust in him, and trumpeting this to my friends and my family, and telling them that I'm trusting in God and I and I love God, and I belong to God, and I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, or whatever it is. I say that, and then God spectacularly and publicly doesn't answer my prayers. And I'd be ashamed. The fault, of course, is not God's. The fault is not God's, and it will not be God's. It may be me. It may be my sin. It may be his fatherly discipline. It may be his sovereignty. Well, David says, don't put me to shame. Later on he says, put my enemies to shame. But don't let me be ashamed. It's a, it's a prayer for preservation, isn't it? It's a prayer for persevering, for God to help me to persevere, for God to preserve me in the way of grace. Don't let me succumb to temptation. Don't let me succumb to weakness. Don't let me become silly in my old age and behave in a silly way and say silly things and do silly things. When the filters are gone, and the facade is dropped and the real, real me starts to come out and then bitterness comes out what's inside what's been inside all the time 
But now the filters are gone, you see, because you're old. Oh no, don't let that happen. Don't let me be ashamed, Lord. Don't let me become a dirty old man or a dirty old woman. Help me to persevere to the end. Lord, help me to keep my marbles. If not, then when all of that is gone, let the sweetness and light that is the real me come out. That which you have put there, let it come to the fore, even then, subconsciously, naturally. Let me prove to be a genuine Christian. Ah, yes, let me never make myself ashamed again. Amen. What a great prayer to pray, isn't it? You see? David, of course, knows about this. He knows about this. And you know, his prayer is wonderfully answered at the end of his life. This very prayer. In specific and wonderfully answered. His life has been marked by all sorts of amazing privileges and blessings and high points from God. But his life has also been marked by sin, bloodshed and sexual sin. Murder. And the murder was so he could gratify his lust. You realise that's what the murder of Uriah the Hittite was about. It was about David covering his tracks and those tracks led all the way to Bathsheba's bedroom. And he was ashamed. Thank God. Now he's prayed, let me never be ashamed again. Well, let me read you about the end of David's life. 1 Kings chapter 1 verses 1 to 4 let me read it to you it's a good postscript on this stuff now David, King David was old advanced in years and they put covers on him but he could not keep warm therefore his servant said to him let a young woman a virgin be sought for our Lord the King and let her stand before the King and let her care for him and let her lie in your bosom that our Lord the King may keep warm. So they sought for a lovely young woman throughout all the territory of Israel and they found Abishag the Shunammite and they brought her to the King. And the young woman was very lovely. And she cared for the king and she served him. But the king did not know her. Hallelujah. His prayer is answered. There's, he's on the brink of eternity. And he's confronted with the temptation and the opportunity and the sin which has marked his character and he's preserved and he's kept and he's strengthened and he resists you know what it means when it says the Lord, he did not know her it doesn't mean he didn't know who she was it means he didn't know her intimately did the Lord answer David's prayer? yes he did did David stay true? Yes, he did. Can the Lord keep you? Yes, he can. Can you? Will you persevere? Yes, you can. Yes, you will. If you apply these kind of lessons to your life. If I apply these kind of lessons to my life. If I listen to David. If I listen to David, it's a resounding yes. Yes. Yes, the Lord can keep me. Yes, the Lord can preserve me. So here's the first golden principle for a golden age. Get a keen sense of your own condition spiritually. 
Not just physically, spiritually. The Lord saves and the Lord keeps. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, help us please. Grant us the grace and help of your Holy Spirit. Teach us to go on being filled with the Holy Spirit, not to quench, and uh, to listen to the voice, that still small voice that speaks in our heart deeply and applies your word to us. Thank you, Lord. And go with us, strengthen us, teach us and keep us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.